In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for this morning. We thank you for our health. We thank you for the blessings you've given to us in our lives. Uh, We want to thank you for this Bible study over the past six weeks, how much we've learned together, how much we've laughed together, how much we've been challenged by the Word of God to seek truth and to live the truth and to practice the truth in our lives. We ask once again for, for grace to, to convert, to move closer and closer towards you, the crucified and resurrected Lord. We lift up all the intentions of our hearts through the, um, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We ask that you protect our family and our friends, and most of all, that you bring us all to everlasting life. And so, as always, we dedicate this Bible study, this conclusion, to St. Paul, as well as to Our Lady as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father. Thank you. You're not rid of me yet. We've got the last things. And the, you know the last things, right? You know, death, judgment, I'm ending on hell because you guys. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm ending on heaven. I'm going to swap it. You said it today just in case you lose us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, no, that's fine. I'm here, in, I'm here a whole nother month, everybody. Whole nother month. You're not going to get rid of me that quickly. And since it's the last class, I could re- tell you what I really think. <laughs> No, I'm just teasing. I'm teasing. All right, folks. Well, then let's begin. Let's begin. Now, today, really, so it's the conclusion, right? Lesson six, the conclusion, chapters 15 and 16. The 16 is where I have pretty much nothing to say on chapter 16. Maybe I'll spend like five minutes on it, which is great because we can spend a whole hour on just this one chapter, chapter 15. And that's awesome because very rarely do we have so much time for just one chapter. And it's a very good chapter. It's on the resurrection. The resurrection of our Lord, but also the resurrection of the just. Those souls who die in a state of grace, those Christians who die in a state of grace, the resurrection, what's it going to be like? So it's very, very good. Now, just by way of introducing today's lesson, as always, I like to uh, bring in quotations from the sources that I read. Tip my hat to, to these great men. And women, for that matter. And uh, there's a great quotation here from Father Montague introducing chapter 15, as well as what it is. It's kind of like the conclusion, the second bookend for the whole epistle. He says, as the Apostles' discourse on the cross, remember, he began, St. Paul, began the book of, or the, the epistle to the Corinthians discussing the cross, the wisdom of God, the crucified Lord. Remember that? Six weeks ago? Seven weeks ago, because we skipped one. So, as uh, the Apostles' discourse on the cross was occasioned by the Corinthians' misunderstanding of the sacrificial death of Jesus, so this section, chapter 15, is occasioned by the misunderstanding by some by some of them, about the reality and nature of the resurrection. So while Paul begins with the crucified Lord, he's going to end with the resurrected Lord. You can't have one without the other. You can't have, as you've heard, I'm sure, many times before, Easter Sunday without... Good Friday. And of course, Good Friday doesn't end there because our Lord rises on the third day. So there's some really good stuff. And actually, I couldn't have planned it um, better because what we're going to be discussing here is kind of like the la- many of the last things. Not so much death, judgment, heaven, and hell, but certainly the resurrection of the dead, which I'm going to touch upon in the very last lesson, literally four weeks from now. Uh, but it's kind of a good segue into to next we are the next program. So, anyways, having said that, we have plenty of time. We have a whole hour to go and, and and wade through chapter 15 because it is a dense chapter. It is very very dense. So I'm grateful that we can go slowly through it. All right, are you all ready? Got your belts tightened, shoelaces is tied, <laughs> seatbelts on. All right, here we go. All right, so it begins with chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, obviously. We begin at the beginning. He says, Now I would remind you, brethren, remember, brethren, he's very, you know, he's pastoral, right? He loves the Corinthians, but he tells them what they need to hear, not what they want to hear, as he's going to kind of lay into them, actually, in chapter 15. I would remind you, brethren, in what terms I preach to you the gospel, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are saved, If, that is a big if, everybody, by which you are saved, if you hold fast, unless you believed in vain. 
For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. And we'll stop. Pardon me. We'll stop there. And talk about a couple of things. So, remember, are a couple of words like jumping out at you, especially, I don't know if you remember very well from chapter 11, but these are words of tradition. Remember I said this epistle was written easily 10, 10 years, maybe even 15 years, before the first gospel was written. And so what was the primary way of depositing, or rather I should say, of transmitting the deposit of faith, God's revelation, the teaching of Christ, by oral tradition, by teaching. And this is what we have here. Okay, when he says, I read received, I delivered to you. Literally, that delivered, and from the Latin, it's I tradition to you, right? Um, Parodidomi, I think is what it is in Greek, if I remember correctly, but I tra- tradition to you. This is the same thing that he said back in ele- chapter 11, verse 23. If you remember, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, and then he goes into the Last Supper. So the reality, the central reality of the creed, by the way, this comes into the creed, right? This is almost like a, a creedal formula as it is, that Christ died, he was buried, and then he rose again on the third day. This is the core of the deposit of faith. It's the central point of what we believe as Catholic Christians, the resurrect, the, the Paschal mystery, part of which, a, a crucial element of which is the Last Supper. So don't forget that the Last Supper is part of the Paschal mystery. And so that's what Paul is, is transmitting here to the Corinthians and reminding them. And again, I, I kind of want to go back here to this big if, all right? We are, and I've said this many, many times, and I'm going to re- review a couple of passages for you simply because I got the time. I'm grateful for that. Salvation is not guaranteed for us without any conditions. We have to cooperate with God's grace. We have to be faithful. We have to obey our Lord. So there is a doctrine. It's not believed by all Protestants. um, But some Protestants say, once saved, always saved. Have you ever heard that? Once saved, always saved. And there have been tragic consequences for this. Where they say, hey, I've, you know, Dr. Bergsma, one of his sets, I forget which one, he tells the story, a first-hand story of how he was going and doing door-to-door evangelization. Maybe it's second-hand, I don't remember. But he tells the story. He's, Dr. Dr. Bergsma is a professor of scripture at uh, Steubenville. Awesome. I, you know, anything that you have find of his, you can read. And by the way, I've got many of his tape sets back there you can listen to. But anyways, I digress. He says that he was doing door-to-door evangelization with this minister, with this pastor, and they came to a house and they, they spread, you know, they shared the gospel with a woman and they said, you know, she believed, she gave her heart to Christ, and then he go, launches into this story with her, these, these hypothetical situations. What if you were to fall into adultery? Would you be saved? And she's like, uh, and he jumps in, yes, you would be saved. And what if you were to murder someone? Would you be saved? Uh, yes, you would be saved. So a couple years later, she ends up leaving her husband, if I remember the story, I might get it slightly wrong, but in any case, she's ended up living in this, living with this man, living in sin, she's not married with him, and then the minister comes back and says, what are you doing? This is wrong. And she goes, but I'm saved. It doesn't matter what I do. I believe in Jesus. I'm saved. And then so Dr. Bergsma shares the story, and it, it struck him the, the tragic consequences, the very logical and tragic consequences that could come of this. So we have to obey our Lord, constantly convert every single day. If we sin, you know, we admit our fault. We go to confession for those of us who are Catholic, and those who aren't Catholic, we bring to RCIA and get them Catholic so they can, you know, go to go to go to receive the sacraments, but this is really important. And um, I counted no less than seven verses of Paul encouraging them to hold fast, to stay true. Now, I don't have them on on the screen here, so we'll just leave these verses up here, but if you go, if you can move, you have quick fingers, everybody. I also have them in your notes. But he says this at least seven times back in chapter 1, verse 18. He says, the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Remember, there's this concept of salvation is a process. It begins with our conversion, our baptism. We are being saved as we live on this earth, and our salvation is made definitive the day we die, if we die in a state of grace. In chapter 4, verse 5, he says, let me find verse 5. i got so many highlights here, I can't find the numbers anymore. Um, Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. So he says, do not pronounce judgment before the time. Don't think that you're, you're in like Flint 
if you might not be, don't pronounce judgment before the time. Chapter 9, verse 27, and I have a sneaking suspicion I'm forgetting one in between 4 and 9, but anyways, 927, I pummel my body and I subdue it lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. Remember those analogies of boxing and running the race? That's the context there. So you've got to subdue your body. You've got to have self-mortification in prayer lest you lose salvation. And then in chapter 10, in verse 27, 12, he says, Therefore, lest anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. This is a very important one because the, the language is the same with here in chapter 15. This is the salvation that, uh, this is the gospel by which you are saved if you hold fast. This is what you stand in. But in chapter 11, Verse 12, he says, "Take if you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. And then we have, of course, this passage in chapter 15. At the end of chapter 15, we're going to see, in verse 58, he says, Be steadfast and movable. Be steadfast. Don't lose your faith. And then, of course, he says the same thing again in chapter 16, verse 13. It's a theme that runs from beginning to end of 1 Corinthians and literally every other passage or every other book of the New Testament. Be steadfast. And so, this is what we as Christians, as Catholic Christians have to be aware of. we got to be steadfast because, man, temptation comes in like a thief in the night. This is another expression from Paul from 1 from Thessalonians. But, you know, temptation sneaks in. The devil's going to find any, any way he can get into your life. And before you know it, your faith is gone. You don't believe what the church teaches anymore. Or you've gone... You know, to, to, to live a life that's not in accordance with the church. And we all, do we all know somebody who this has happened to? Slowly, but little by little, slowly, and sure, slowly but surely, there's a gradual move away from the faith. And he says, be steadfast, watch out. As Peter says, the, de- the devil is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking for someone to devour. That's terrible, right? So anyways, I really wanted to, to spend a few moments... Uh, sharing this with you because salvation is not guaranteed. Yes, if we obey Christ, if we love Christ, then it's guaranteed. Christ will save us so long as we cooperate with him. Okay, it's by his grace we are saved. I can go on and on and on about that, but I think that's enough for now. So to go back here to this, to this creedal formula of the resurrection, Paul says a couple of times in accordance with the scriptures. You know, the Old Testament has numerous passages of the resur- talking about the resurrection of the dead and, of course, the resurrection of Christ. And there are a couple of, I think, really beautiful ones um, in the Old Testament. I'm going to focus just on two, although I've got a number of different passages for you in your notes. But this is the Valley of Dry Bones from Ezekiel 37. Do you remember this, everybody? This is a, I, I'm so just dying for some, some film genius to put this all together. I'm going to read this for you. It's only like 11 verses, maybe 12 verses. I'm going to read it for you. And uh, I would just use your imagination to have all this come together. I think it would be phenomenal with our technology. Like Pixar or something like that could, can make it all happen together. We can get some of these directors. Mel Gibson, maybe he should do this, right? <laughs> this is a computer animated thing. It's not real. No, it's not real. It looks, so this is what I'm saying. With our technology, we can make things look real. Now, let me read this image. This is one of the most beautiful, powerful images of the resurrection of the dead, but also the resurrection of the body of Christ, right? The people of Israel. It has both images to it. So if you can, if you have quick fingers and you want to follow along, it's in Ezekiel 37, um, or you can just listen. It says this, and of course, this is one of the passages that Paul has in mind. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me round among them, and behold, there were very many upon the valley. And behold, they were very dry, which means they had been dead a long time. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath. There's the imagery of creation. Remember, God breathing into Adam. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and I will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as, was, as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. <laughs> I love this image. I want like Mel Gibson to put this together, right? 
And behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And as I looked, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and the skin had covered them, but there was no spirit in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the Spirit, prophesy, son of man, and say to the Spirit, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O Spirit, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the Spirit came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great host. And it goes on. It's just beautiful, okay? And there's the two sticks right afterwards. So there's this beautiful image, right, of the dry bones of the people of God, Israel, the new Israel, and the individuals themselves coming up to new life. There's this image here. There's also in Daniel chapter 2. Very powerful image that begins, At that time shall arise Michael. There's some imagery of the end of the world, yeah, sort of apocalyptical stuff here. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge over your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered. Every one whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. This is a really powerful verse in Daniel. Keep a couple of images in mind, folks, okay, as we go through chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Dust. Dust is a key word, okay? Obviously, we think of creation, but Paul's going to talk about Adam and creation and dust in a little bit, okay? And the fact that the, both the, res, the resurrection of the dead for those who go to everlasting life, as well as those who go to everlasting death. Those who go to everlasting life will shine like the stars in the firmament. And get this, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever ever and ever. This was, recalls another passage, I believe, from James, James, you know, when we turn a soul from sin, we cover a multitude of sins. When we save, or save someone, we bring someone to righteousness, we will cover a multitude of sins. Beautiful imagery here of the resurrection, and there are so many more. Jesus, don't forget, on the road to Emmaus, he also talked about himself and his resurrection, taught these two numbskulls, <laughs> all right, about the resurrection, right? They didn't get it. They didn't understand. And what did he say? Oh, foolish men. Jesus just just had a moment of weakness. He called them foolish. Remember, he's meek and mild, right? No, Jesus is tough, right? You foolish men. Paul says this later on, by the way. And slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now that would have been an awesome Bible study. Okay? That would have been an amazing Bible study. So Jesus teaches them according to, in accordance to the scriptures, his paschal mystery. And Paul is saying the same thing. In accordance with the scriptures, Christ died, he was buried, and then he rose again. So, as something Tim Gray had pointed out as well, it's not just a handful of texts, everybody, like we saw in Ezekiel 37 and Daniel chapter 2. It's all the scriptures. It's from, from Moses to all the prophets. It's, it's scripture as a whole points towards the paschal mystery. We've got to see in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ crucified, died, and risen from the dead. Because they all speak to him. And the people of Israel, in the the, uh, the story of the Exodus, and so many other instances, all of scripture points forward to the Paschal event and the resurrection from the dead. And it's also important to remember, in looking at the scriptures, only Jesus Christ was foretold, everyone. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not Confucius, nobody. Only Jesus Christ, only he. His birth, life, death, burial, and resurrection was foretold hundreds, if not thousands of years before it actually happened. That's a powerful, powerful um, thought, argument for the divinity of Jesus Christ. Only Christ was foretold, no one else. Okay? So, in any case... um, I kind of mentioned this already. I anticipated I have an extra slide for you, although I took, took away my own thunder. Remember, this is a, uh, the resurrection concerns both those who are going to 
spend eternity in hell and those who are going to spend eternity in heaven. As we saw in Daniel chapter 12, verse 2. Remember, I pointed that out just now. But also, Acts 24, Paul himself says this elsewhere. I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law or written in the prophets. Again, the scriptures. Having a hope in God, which these themselves accept. The Pharisees. The belief in the resurrection of the dead goes all the way back throughout the Old Testament. True, the Sadducees didn't believe it. And they were Sadducee. But... I couldn't help it. I know it's a way overused joke. It's a way overused joke. Don't leave. Please don't leave. Don't leave. But the Sadducees didn't. The Pharisees did. And then, all right, let's move on because, you know, that's bad. And then there will be a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Okay? That's important as well. All right, everyone? So, let's move on to verses 5 through 11. Okay? Or 5 through 9, specifically. Paul goes on. Not only do we believe this, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but then Jesus appeared to Cephas. Who's that? Peter. Peter. Then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time. Wow. That would be amazing, right? Most of them whom are still alive, although some have fallen asleep, some have died. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. So Paul is saying, he he died, he was buried, he rose again, then he appeared to everybody. He appeared to them, most of them are still alive. If you don't believe me, go call them up. Look them up in the phone book, okay? Call them up and say, what happened? You were there, you were part of the crowd, you were one of the 500. What happened? You saw him, you touched him, you perhaps... You ate a meal with him as Jesus ate a meal with his his 12. This is huge, okay? He appeared to them. These appearances are confirmations of his resurrection. It's not just some myth invented by the apostles because they wanted to try to gain some wealth or some fame, which they certainly did not, okay? They, of course, go read what happened to St. Paul. He suffered every single day. He was, I don't know how many times he was stoned. He goes into this in 2 Corinthians, shipwrecked and whipped and all these things, all right? These are confirmations. The disciples didn't believe at first. Remember how cowardly they were? They even Christ appeared to them. They didn't believe. Then, of course, there's the doubting Thomas. I will not believe until, until I put my finger in his side and in his hands. They didn't believe at first, but then they came around. They were converted. They saw and they believed. Okay, so Paul encountering Christ as well is a testimony. Yes, he wasn't there with the twelve, but he, he Christ, appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. He, Christ appeared in his res- resurrected, his transfigured body, and Paul was converted as well. And this is all very, very important because we receive the testimony of the resurrection, just like Paul says in the beginning of chapter 15. It's not something that, you know, it's a myth, like, you know, I said, I've said before, Zeus or Hermes or Athena or any of the other Greek and Roman gods. This is a historical fact seen by the five, experienced through all five senses of the, by the apostles and many other people, okay? Very powerful. We believe their testimony because it's true. So the resurrection isn't just a metaphor. This is the climax of our faith. This is why Paul is spending so much time on it here in this chapter. It's not just a metaphor. As the catechism says, the mystery of Christ's resurrection is a real event. It's not a resuscitation of the body. It's not like Jesus passed out and then all of a sudden he kind of woke up in the tomb and been like, Oh, wow, where am I? This is an opportunity. I'll tell everybody I rose from the dead. Okay? Then he struggled and moved that huge mass of stone. No. It's a real event. It's, he really died. He was really buried and rose again. Then there are manifestations that are historically verified, as Paul just said, as the New Testament bears witness. And then Paul could already write to the Corinthians what we just said. He received the testimony. He delivered it to the Corinthians. And then Jesus appeared to everyone. We just studied that. The apostle speaks here of the living tradition of the resurrection, which he had learned after his conversion at the gates of Damascus. And this is what we pass down to our children and their children's children and so on and so forth. It is a living tradition of Christ's resurrection. All pretty powerful, right? Okay, let's move on now. Let's look at our resurrection. Paul, in these next number of verses, from chapter, well, obviously chapter 15, from verse 12 to verse 34, he's going to talk about our resurrection in Christ. Then after the resurrection in general, he's going to talk about how we're going to be raised. What is the resurrected body like? Have you ever thought about that, by the way? What's the resurrection like? And we've got to be careful, folks, as Christians. In heaven, we're going to have our body. 
And I'm going to talk about this in, during the, the very last lesson here. We're, it's not just like we're disembodied souls, right? Like the, like the well, I'm going to say here in a moment. In fact, pause there. Let me go on. I don't want to get ahead of myself, okay? Um, so, verse 12 to 19, Paul goes on. Now, if Christ is preached as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. That's, that follows. That's logical. If Christ has not been raised, then there are a number of consequences of this. Then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all men most to be pitied. Wow. So, why? first off, go back to the beginning. Chapter, well, I keep saying that, pardon me. Verse 12. Why are some people denying the resurrection? Because they were Greek. And that says so much. The Greeks, no matter where you were in the Greek world, could not possibly comprehend that this body was good. They thought the body was a prison. You needed to release the soul, the spirit of a human being, out of this prison. Why? I mean, look at your bodies. I don't want to be insulting, but our bodies are weak. (laughs) Look at that wicked... No, don't get me wrong. Our bodies, they get sick. Right? Diseases, we get injured. The older we get, the more weak we get. Our bodies fall apart. Okay? <laughs> Some of you, you're laughing because well, maybe you know better. Okay? <laughs> this, this is the reality of our bodies. And so the, the Corinthians said, or Corinthians, Corinthians as well as all the Greeks, said, the body is, we don't want this body. We, our soul needs, maybe our souls res- resurrect us. Maybe they thought it was a spiritual resurrection of sorts. You know, we, we will not go into everlasting spiritual damnation. Our souls will, will go into, to, into heaven. And, and Paul is saying, no, we're talking about a bodily resurrection here. Okay? And the fact that the people couldn't believe in the resurrection has been consistent throughout all these past 2,000 years. Nobody, folks, nobody believed in a bodily resurrection. Nobody. Okay? Although some Greeks have believed that there has been life after death, it has never been in terms of a bodily resurrection after death. So the Catechism again says, from the beginning, the Christian faith in the resurrection has met with incomprehension and opposition. In quoting St. Augustine, St. Augustine says, on no point does the Christian faith encounter more opposition than on the resurrection of the body. It is very commonly accepted that the life of the human person continues in a spiritual fashion after death, but how can we believe that this body, so clearly mortal, could rise to everlasting life? And this is true even today. You find even, unfortunately, you know... Catholic authorities, priests, and, and, and you know, the, the, the intelligent, the intellectuals, the scholars saying, no, there's no real, real resurrection in the body. It's kind of like a spiritual resurrection. And then they would, you know, go and remember the tomb of Jesus, I guess that was found, or some weird thing like that. Uh, it's like, you know, any, any archaeological thing that might lead to some argument that Jesus' his body has been found, Catholics don't have a problem. Do you realize that if Jesus is his bones are rotting somewhere. What in the world are we doing here? Like Paul says, what are we doing here? And, and I can't possibly understand how Catholics, I don't mean just Catholics in general, but okay, sure. Catholics in general, but also priests and, and, and academics can say, yeah, if the, res- if the uh, resurrection of Christ never happened, it won't bother me. It doesn't hurt my faith. I'm sorry. It'll hurt my faith. You know, wouldn't it hurt yours? I mean, wouldn't you maybe decide, as we're going to see later, go eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die? Paul, I mean, Paul's a very logical guy. He's going to say this. So the resurrection is real. All right. Now, Paul says there are consequences for denying the resurrection. Many of them. Did you catch these? Number one, if you deny the resurrection, then Jesus hasn't been raised either. You've got to be consistent. Either there is a resurrection or there isn't. And there is because Christ has been raised. Number two, then our faith is in vain. This word vain goes all the way through chapter 15. Because if the resurrection didn't happen, then everything is in vain. To remember verse 2, he says, he talks about the gospel in which we are saved if we hold fast, unless you believed in vain, he says. So again, if the resurrection didn't happen, then we have believed in vain. Number three, 
then the apostles are false witnesses about Jesus Christ, about God. They're going around preaching the resurrection of the dead. If it didn't happen, they're big fat liars. Huge liars. Pinocchio's everywhere. Okay? And that's a big thing to bear false witness against God. Number four, then there's no salvation because we're still in our sins. The resurrection of Christ, the death and resurrection of Christ is conquering sin and death. If he didn't rise, we're still in our sins. And finally, number five, we are the most to be pitied. Why? We sacrifice so much. We say we're going to live moral, virtuous lives. We try. We aim to live moral, virtuous lives. We say no to so much in this life because we believe in life after death. If there's no life after death, if there's no resurrection, we are the most to be pitied because we're missing out on a lot of, quote-unquote, fun. Okay? So these are dire consequences for denying the resurrection of Christ. Then after these verses, he says, look, he's very logical. He moves on in verses 20 to 27, talking about the end. There's a very brief teaching here on the end of all things. He goes into much more detail in First and Second Thessalonians, and I'll touch upon that in just a little bit. But he says in verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised. So don't panic. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, that's the second coming, right, that we believe in, at his parousia, his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. And we'll stop there. Okay? Here, Paul is doing typology. Remember I gave you typology moments? You know, you know that trademark, right? Typology moment. Here, Christ is a new Adam. Death comes from the original Adam. He comes from the dust, as Paul is going to teach in a moment. Everlasting life comes from the new Adam. Now, when, if Jesus is described in terms of a new Adam, we have to understand this is, this is couched. It's, it's sandwiched in the imagery of a new creation. You can't have a new Adam without a new creation. And that's integral to what heaven is all about. What, then there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Hang out with me for just four more weeks. In the fourth week, I'll tell you more about that And when we talk about the last thing. So here's the new Adam, right? There's solidarity with one and the other. We have, in a certain way, we are one body with Adam. We are all of his descendants, his and, and Eve's, okay? So we are part of the human race, right? The, 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 the body of the human race. Therefore, we share death because we come from Adam. Does that make sense? But because we're baptized into Christ, the new Adam, we share in his everlasting life. We share in his resurrection. But Christ comes first. That's what it, Paul means by first fruits. This is, you know, this is a feast, right? One of the seven major feasts of, of the Jewish calendar. The feast of first fruits. I guess technically there's one in the fall, one in the spring. But you, you probably understand, right? The Jews were, the Israelites rather, were supposed to give God the first fruits of the harvest. Sort of a tithe, so to speak. A consecration of the first fruits of the harvest. This was on the Feast of Pentecost for them. They would give it to the Lord. They would consecrate it to the Lord in an act of thanksgiving, of worship, and of, of course, um, willful dependence on who God is as a providing Father. Now, Jesus is the first fruits, right, given to God in the ascension. This, there's a lot more we could say about this. Actually, Brant Petrie, I always recommend him, right? One of these days, I'm going to call him my friend. He's awesome. Right now, I'm just a distant admirer. But... In some of these CD sets, in a couple of them, he talks about this, but we don't have time to get into it now. In any case, Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. What's the rest of the fruit? We are. We, too, will rise from the dead in the same manner as Christ rose from the dead. What happened to Christ in his resurrected, transfigured, glorified body will also happen to us. Okay, that's very important. And we have an interrelated mysteries here. The second, in fact, let me just uh, share this with you. Um, 
In fact, this is the image I used for my poster. There's, there are three realities hap- that are going to happen surrounding the resurrection of the dead. And I'm going to briefly touch upon it now, and then we'll look at it more in the next class. But there's the second coming of Jesus Christ. At the end of all things, Christ will come again. All right. uh, then there is the general resurrection of the just and the unjust, as we saw. All the souls will rise from the dead, and then there will be the last judgment of all the nations together. Okay, So if you can hold on and be patient, we'll talk about that a little bit more. But when Christ comes again, as Paul says here in verse 24, let me reread it. At his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, and he will deliver the kingdom of God the Father after destroying every rule, authority, and power. Okay, So Christ comes again and he destroys all evil, both the spiritual angels, those fallen angels, as well as there is going to be an an antichrist. There will be a great tribulation. There are going to be physical and spiritual evils that Christ will conquer and subject under his feet. Then he will give the kingdom to his father. He will present the kingdom, which is what we're living in now, what the kingdom is growing now. He will present it to the father. Does this make sense, everyone? All right. So... The presenting of the kingdom to the Father, Father Montague says, is an image of the king's son. This, of course, happened all the time in you know, ages past, through the ancient world and the medieval world, of the king's son who goes out to conquer for his father and returns in a triumphant parade. Having wrested the kingdom from, of the world from all hostile powers, primarily sin and death, Jesus now presents it to his father, kneeling before him, as it were, in humble obeisance. In his humanity, which he has shared with humankind in creation, that Jesus subjects himself to the Father. For as the divine Son, he is equal to the Father, proceeding from him by way of generation, um, as the creeds say. So he presents the huma- our humanity and all creation to the Father. Because re- and he remember, just look at the... Uh, The passion in the garden, right? He says, not my will, but thy will be done. He subjects his will, his body, his intellect, his human nature to the will of the Father. He presents all of this, the kingdom, to the Father. Because he has finally conquered everything. He has built up the kingdom, which is the church. Does this make sense, everyone? We're going to talk a lot more about this in in that fourth lesson, okay? I keep dropping these hints, so you've got to come. All right. So all things are going to be subjected to him. That's very, very important at the end. And that is when we are going to rise from the dead. Okay. So then he goes on and draws some final conclusions about the general resurrection. He says in verse 29, Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? We're going to come to that. Does Mormonism ring in your head right now? All right. Why am I in peril every hour? I protest, brethren, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ our Lord, I die every day. Because remember, he said before, I pummel my body, right? I subdue it. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fight with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Come to your right mind, and sin no more. For some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. So he's concluding this first half of chapter 15. Now, this first verse here, verse 29, very confusing, right? People being baptized on behalf of the dead. You know the Mormons do this, right? In fact, I mean, there's jokes going around like they got notches in their belt. How many people did you save? How many times were you baptized on behalf of the dead? Oh, I was baptized a hundred times on behalf of the dead. They get baptized on behalf of all their ancestors. This is why they have such the best genealogy records ever. Does that make, no, I'm serious. That's reality. They have the best genealogy records ever because they get baptized on behalf of their ancestors. And it comes from this verse. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Thank you. So, the Ignatius Study Bible says, This passage continues to baffle interpreters. <laughs> Since neither the form nor the meaning of this practice is familiar to us today. There are a couple of interpretations. Perhaps 
living believers were receiving baptism for the sake of deceased persons, hoping its benefits would accrue to them in the afterlife. That's what the Mormons do. So the interpretation is, Paul is simply mentioning this practice, which might have been present, or in fact it was present in his age, without condemning it nor condoning it. He's just simply saying, his point is, if there's no resurrection of the dead, why are they being baptized? Okay, he's not condemning the practice, nor is he condoning the practice. Does that make sense? He's simply mentioning it because he's got another point in mind. That's one possibility. Another possibility, suggested by the verses that follow, is that Paul is talking about people who endure a baptism of suffering for the sake of others who are physically or spiritually dead. Either way, Paul reasons that such baptisms are pointless apart from belief in a future resurrection. Now, This second possibility here is more common among Catholics. There is a baptism of suffering. Remember Jesus said, I have a baptism with which to be baptized, right? He's talking about his suffering. When we suffer, our suffering can be offered for the sake of the dead, those souls in purgatory. This is de fide. This is part of the Catholic faith. Paul says in Colossians 1.24, you could write that down in your notes. I don't have it there for you. But in Colossians 1.24, he says, he makes up for what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the church. So it's possible that he has, a, there's a spiritual interpretation here, being baptized in suffering for the sake of those souls in purgatory. And that's perfectly acceptable in Catholic theology. But again, either way, his point is... There's no resurrection. It's pointless. Okay, so you can enjoy the uh, the genealogical services that the Mormons provide, but give them a good Bible study when they come to your house. Okay, <laughs> all right. You got your you got all the notes now. You can go and teach them. All right, very good. So let's move on here. Okay, let's move on. Um, verses thirty two to thirty four here. He's I'm remind, uh, kind of going back to what we just read. All right. Why am I in peril every day? I protest. I die every day. What do I gain if there's no resurrection of the dead? Remember this. I just read it. Okay. Come to your right mind. Sin no more. Some of you have no knowledge of God. He says of this on and on. Again, the whole point is there's, again, these passages here of suffering, of dying every day for the Lord. That's that baptism of suffering we were just talking about. It's pointless. And some people, philosophies are very common about this, you know, the only thing worth living for is pleasure. Pleasure is the only thing worth living for. Eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. We're going to die sometime. There's nothing more certain than death, everybody, and nothing more uncertain than than the time of its arrival, than the hour of its arrival. Okay, so, hey, there's no resurrection, then let's just do whatever we want to do for tomorrow we die. And this is probably what the Corinthians were doing. Okay, those who denied the resurrection for whatever reason were living whatever life they wanted to live because they thought, oh, I'm not getting this body back. It doesn't matter. But Paul says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Okay, bad company, but also bad theology. If you believe there's no resurrection, your morals are going to be corrupted. So that's why he says, come to your right mind, sin no more. Don't sin in your body. And this goes back to everything he said before about the body being a temple of the Holy Spirit. Remember that? In chapters, uh, well, three, five through seven, really, uh, including chapter three. But he says, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do not sin against your body, especially in immorality. Okay? Bad company ruins good morals. What you think, what you believe is going to determine how you live. Amen? That's why the church takes great care to ensure solid teaching. We can't have bad teaching enter into our lives because our actions will follow as a consequence, a negative consequence. All right? Very good. Now, that's the first half of chapter 15. The second half of chapter 15 is on the resurrected body itself. What is the resurrected body going to be like, everybody? I think this is fascinating. I don't know if you do. I mean, I want to be there. I want to see what it's going to be like. Because, by the way, this whole passage is only about the resurrection of the just. The resurrection of the unjust is probably going to get, well, our bad bodies. I don't know. I haven't actually thought about that yet. What kind of body will the unjust get? Probably something, well, I'm going to share with you four qualities of the resurrected glorified body, but we'll get there. Okay. So verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish man. (laughs) Just love Paul, right? Remember Jesus said to his disciples, you foolish men, you know, hey, patience is infinite, but it kind of wears thin sometimes. You foolish man, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. 
And what you sow is not the body which is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. He's using an analogy from um, agriculture. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is alike, but there is one kind for men, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. And there are celestial bodies, and there are terrestrial bodies. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's the analogy here. The terrestrial is our bodies here. The celestial is our resurrected bodies. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another the stars. For star differs from star in glory. Okay? So, this whole analogy of the seed, let's unpack this a little bit. The seed must die before it rises again. Have you heard this before? Jesus. Remember John chapter 12? Verse, verse, verse 24, Jesus said, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus, in his resurrection, is the first fruit. So when we die, when, we're, when we rise again, we bear fruit, eternal fruit, so to speak. And this all has to be connected with, you know, um, the, the tree of life. There's a lot of great imagery there. But So Jesus said this, and remember Paul said, okay, you got to die. The terrestrial has to die before the celestial, before the, the resurrected glorified body must come to everlasting life. Then he gave this analogy of, you know, the sun differs from the moon and stars differ from stars. This is important for us. In heaven, we will not all have the same glory. A lot of people struggle with this. We will all have different glories based upon how we lived in this life. Because that's justice. We will all be glorified, but we will have different glories. And the imagery of glory as stars is, remember I said at the beginning of this passage? Passage, pardon me. Of this lesson in Daniel chapter, uh, well, I didn't say this. Maybe I made a mistake. Uh, 12, 1 and 3, I'll have to go back and look at that. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. You will shine like the stars. And Jesus says also in Matthew 13, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. That's the kind of glory that we will have. This is one of the four characteristics, which is called brightness. Which is called brightness. Yes. Yeah. Right, the thimble and the gla- and the, the thimble and the gallon comes from Saint Teresa of Lisieux. Actually, that was her image when she was a little girl. We will all be full, but some of us only have the capacity for a thimble. Others will have the capacity as a for a bucket. We're all full with grace. We're all full with God's glory. But some have more than others, and that's all dependent upon how we live in this life. Okay, does that make sense? All right, we're going to come back to this later on. So he goes on then in verses forty-two to forty-four. After the analogies of the comparison between the terrestrial and the celestial, he says, so it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown, that is, of course, our earthly bodies, our terrestrial bodies, is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. Okay, so this, he's used these natural analogies, this analogy of, from agriculture and the comparison between heaven and earth, okay, to describe what happens in the resurrection. Okay, now, this, t- talking about the spiritual body, I want to mention one thing because it seems like everybody I've studied always mentions it as well, so apparently there's some confusion out there. All right, when he says what is raised is a spiritual body, he's not saying that we're just going to be spiritual like the angels. He's saying he's to, by spiritual he means a, a body that is governed by the spirit. Okay, it is a resurrected, glorified body, trans formed by the spirit making it a spiritual body we're still having we're going to have flesh and bones a resurrected glorified body but it's spiritual because it is transformed by the spirit who gives us life does that make sense this body that we have here in the in the sacraments we have a pledge of this experience okay the spirit dwells within us we are temples of the holy spirit but again we come from adam we come from dust now and then we're going to get to that in just a moment so so, here's, here's what I mean by those four different, ver- well, four aspects, characteristics of the resurrected body. Uh, Catholic theology enumerates these four qualities, which are, number one, impassibility. 
Impassibility means we're not going to suffer. Remember, Revelation says there will be no death, there will be no tears. We're not going to suffer. You can get hit with a sledgehammer and it won't hurt. You'll be like a superhero. <laughs> All right. Well, impassibility, there will be no suffering of any kind. Agility, which means freedom from weakness. Okay? Freedom from weakness. There will be no more weakness. In fact, you look at Jesus. He could appear like agility, move quickly. So again, superhero almost. Right? It's like going to be kind of interesting to design a whole superhero uh, comic book based on the resurrected bodies. But agility. Jesus was able to appear and disappear behind locked doors. Remember this? That's agility. It's been said in the new heavens and the new earth. You kind of like beam me up, Scotty. Bam, bam. You go from different, at the speed of thought, you're able to move your resurrected, glorified body from one side of the new heavens and the new earth to the other. It's like, hey, on the opposite side of the solar system, there's a party going on. Let's go. Bam, we're there. Okay? Agility. Number three, subtility. Subtility. That means that our body is going to be subject to the soul. Right now, when we lost this in the fall, right now our bodies say, I want this, I want that. I want Dunkin' Donuts. I want Dunkin' Donuts. Okay, sure, Dunkin' Donuts. (laughs) That's not, you know, the body is not subject to the soul. Number three, brightness. I've said this before, right? Outward irradiance in proportion to the degree of inward holiness. This is important. If, hmm, I was going to say a couple of things. Just pause in my mind. I've got to rewind in my mind. Okay, that rhymes. Hey. What we do in this life, as I said before, has everything to do with the treasures we have in heaven. The degree to which we obey Christ, we serve Christ, the degree to which we are holy in this life reflects, no pun intended, the brightness that we have in heaven. So the soul who, some people say, it's not fair that if someone lives a life of sin, then on their deathbed, they convert. But they're not going to be too bright. (laughs) Seriously. The soul who lives from childhood a life of sacrifice, of service, of love, they will shine much brighter than the person who converted on their deathbed. There is justice, everybody. There is justice. Anybody can be saved. Maybe some will flicker. I don't know. I hope I'm not getting into trouble saying anything wrong, but I believe this is the case. So these are the four characteristics. All right. So get holy, folks. You know, you want to you shine like the angels, shine like the stars, I should say. You know, make the sacrifices and know that every sacrifice you make, every step towards holiness you make, you will shine brighter and better. Don't make it like a competition because that's, you know, not holiness. I'm going to shine more than you. So help me, God. I'm going to shine more than you in heaven. That's not the right motive. (laughs) Anyways, okay. So he goes on. We've got to come to a conclusion here. He goes on in verses 45 through 50. He goes back. This is going to ring true for you because he goes back and gives some more typology with Adam and Jesus. Okay? And we're just going to read this and then continue on. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, that's Jesus, obviously, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual which is first, but the physical, and then the spiritual. In other words, Adam, the physical body, comes first, then through Christ, the new Adam, the spiritualized body, the, the, the glorified, spiritualized body comes. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. There's that imagery of dust again. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are of the dust. That's everyone. As it is in the man of heaven, so are those who are of heaven, those who are baptized. Just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, so shall we also bear the image of the man of heaven. I tell you this, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. So again, there's the same language that we have been studying here in the, in the past, well, in the first half of the chapter. We have to die first. The flesh and blood that comes from Adam must die before Christ raises us up again, and we have the spiritual body, the life-giving, um, well, the, the body that comes from the life-giving spirit, and that will inherit. The imperishable spiritual body will inherit the kingdom of God, will inherit, inherit heaven. All right? Now, after he says all of this, He concludes, verse 51, Lo, I tell you a mystery, and indeed it is truly a mystery. We can understand it in part, but the whole thing we cannot understand, especially apart from God's revelation. I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. 
He goes back here to the second coming, this imagery we saw just a moment ago. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall all be changed. For this perishable nature must put on the imperishable, and this mortal nature must put on immortality. Again, same comparison between perishable and perishable, mortal and immortality. But this will all happen at the second coming. The second coming, when Christ comes again on that Shekinah glory cloud, all right, the glory of God, he comes, the trumpets will sound, it's a big, everyone will know, it's not some secret thing, everyone will see Christ coming again on the clouds, okay? So, this twinkling of an eye, actually, the next slide here from Philippians 3, Paul says this to the Philippians, our common wealth is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lower, lowly body to be like his glorious body, by the power which enables him even to subject all things to himself. Pretty much almost verbatim of what he's telling the Corinthians, he told the Philippians. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, when the trumpet blasts. The trumpet, folks, is a very important imagery. It comes, comes from the Old Testament, and it's in numerous places in the Old Testament. Okay? Several uses of the trumpet, this is the uh, Ignatius Study Bible, several uses of the trumpet in ancient Israel fill out the background to this image. The trumpet was, number one, a liturgical instrument summoned that, or that summoned Israel to meet the Lord, to worship Him on the Feast of Trumpets, and to enjoy His rest every Jubilee year. That, of course, represents heaven, right? The trumpet will sound. We as the people will go to meet God. An eternal Jubilee year. The trumpet was also a military instrument that called soldiers to battle. This, of course, is when Christ will conquer evil, right? Every power, every authority, every evil that fights against him. It's a military symbol. Trumpet imagery is also used in the prophets to signal Israel's restoration from covenant death of exile and to commence the judgment on the wicked on the day of the Lord. Again, this is the last judgment. This is when our exile will end and we will be caught up to have an everlasting covenant with God in heaven. So all three of these images here, liturgically, militarily, and as well as of judgment, this all happens at the last, or at the last, the second coming, when Christ comes again, and we will, the trumpet will blast, we will all be raised, and there will be that final judgment of all nations, okay? So, does this make sense to all of you? Yes. And at that moment, at the resurrection, we will all be changed. Now, I have to share with you 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 4-17. through 17. Again, just like Paul taught in the Corinthians, just like he taught to the Philippians, he teaches the Thessalonians the same things. What's going to happen with the, the second coming, the resurrection, the last judgment? And I'm sharing this with you, even though it's going to take us longer than I want. I'm sharing it with you because there's a lot of confusion on this point. Because it all has to do with the rapture. Do we believe the rapture? All this stuff. So let me read this longish, these three verses here from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Paul says, again, For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep, those who have died. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, we who are left until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command. There's, again, that military imagery, right? With the archangel's call and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, shall be caught up. That word in Latin is rapiemur, from which the Protestants get the rapture. We will be caught up. It's a future passive tense. We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Same imagery over there, right? The trumpet, there's the resurrection. He will come with the archangel's call, and, uh, and then the, the dead will rise first. Now, those pe- this is interesting. It's kind of a source of debate among theologians. Obviously, when Jesus comes, there are going to be people alive. What about them? Are they going to die? Or not. Or it seems, Paul is saying, they're going to be instantly changed. There will be some who will not taste death. The caveat here is when this comes, there's going to be a massive tribulation. So they're going to be suffering like crazy. Okay? So they're going to endure a suffering of sorts, a death of sorts. And then when Christ comes, they will all be transformed. But the dead will rise first into their glorified bodies. Okay, that's the chronology. The dead rise first, then those who are alive, they will also be changed, and they will be rapiemur, they will be raptured up with Christ. Now, 
Does this mean there is a rapture, everybody? Do you know what the rapture is? You know, the rapture is, I used to believe this, okay? Um, So I'm speaking with experience. Although I wasn't an authority on the rapture or anything, I did believe this. Basically, in simple terms, rapture, and this belief has only been around give or take 100 years. I mean, literally, it's a brand new belief. Talk about Protestants accusing Catholics of making up stuff. Give me a break. All right? So this was made up. There's a whole, you know, John Nelson Darby received this vision from a little girl. And it just, it spread from there. It very much is a, well, it's very much wrong. Now, the belief is, right when the, right when the tribulation is supposed to occur, which we as Catholics believe, some tribula- people who believe in the tribulation or the rapture say, well, there's pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. When will the, and there's a whole debate, I mean, you could seriously get into major fist fights on whether or not the rapture is going to happen pre, mid, or post-tribulation. But God is going to rapture up secret. He's going to come secretly and take the true Christians. So, you've seen bumper stickers. In case of rapture, this vehicle will be unmanned. You're going to be driving with your buddy. You know, you've seen that? Yeah, we're, you're going to be driving with your buddy, right? He's driving, and all of a sudden, boom, he's gone. You're like, oh, my gosh, and you're going to crash. And, you know, there's the Left Behind series, all this stuff, okay? The problem with, there are two major problems with this. Number one, it's not, if you remember what we just read in First, um, First Thessalonians, it's not, it's anything but secret, right? There's trumpets blasting, the archangel cries, there's, it's, everything's very loud. It's not a secret rapture. The second thing is, Paul clearly describes the resurrection of the dead here. This is not part, I mean, the rapture, there's no resurrection of the dead, although maybe a few people see the problem. They say, oh, the, the, the righteous will rise from the dead as well. Then there's the tribulation, and then Jesus is going to come again, which makes it a third coming, a second, second coming. And there's another resurrection of the dead after the, it's just way problematic. This verse that I read to you in 1 Thessalonians 4 simply describes what's going to happen at the end. The second coming, Christ comes at the trumpet call, and the imagery that I explained to you from the Ignatius Study Bible, all that's very important. The dead will rise, Christ will conquer death and sin and all, you know, Satan and the Antichrist, and that's it. That's the last judgment. All the nations will be judged. It's that simple. There is no rapture. So don't go out and, you know, sell your stocks and sell your house and all these different things. The Lord is coming. Seems like every single year there's another date, right? Oh, the Lord's coming really this time. I forgot to read the the iota in the Hebrew, and that iota tells us we're one year off. But this year he's coming. This year is the secret rapture. Well, you just gave away the secret, buddy. Anyways. (laughs) It's annoying. People's lives are destroyed by this. So that's why you got to be Catholic. Stay in the ark, right? Stay in the church. Oh, boy. All right, everybody. So here we go. This is the last, last verse here. Um, he concludes, When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy victory? O death, where is thy sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, here's the crescendo, right folks? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, again, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He began the chapter 15 talking about not believing in vain. He ends the chapter saying, continue to be steadfast, thus so your labor will not be in vain. So very good stuff here. He quotes you know, a couple of passages from Isaiah and Hosea. I have them there in your notes there. But basically the whole concept is, and Paul is teaching, through the resurrection, sin and death is going to be destroyed. Forever, there will be a resurrection of all the dead, and we will all reign in him, with him in heaven. The, the, basically, the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's all the same imagery from Revelation. So I encourage you to go back and read those passages. So all very good. That's the end of chapter 15. I only have one thing to say with chapter 16, and then we're going to conclude, okay? In chapter 16, really, verses 1 through 4, as I have on the notes, he, he calls them, you know, as Catholics do, he asks for money. 
Right? He asks for money on the first day of the week. That's, of course, Sunday, Sunday Mass. He asks for a tithe. Verses 5 through 12, he gives some instructions on traveling, right? Traveling companions. And verse 13 is the perfect summary. 13 and 14 is the summary of what we have studied together these past six weeks. Be watchful, stand firm in your faith, be courageous, be strong. Let all you do be done in love. Remember, chapter 13, the great ode to love, right? The beautiful poem of love. Let everything you do be done in love. Let that be your motive and be steadfast. Okay? And again, he ends talking about love in the very last two passages, everybody. All right? So, that's the end of of chapter 15 and 16. It's the end of the epistle. I have in the bottom of your notes kind of a review. I did put them on the slide here. Um... Basically, as okay, just allow me. Don't go anywhere for just a moment. Chapters 1 through 4, we saw weeks ago, right? We saw the divisions of the church, you know, their pride, their arrogance, their reliance on human wisdom, right? The fact that they boasted in knowledge. They had arrogance. They had knowledge in, uh, under, in, 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 well, they think they had knowledge, but they didn't understand what the wisdom of God was, the crucified Lord, right? Remember all this? Chapters 1 through 4, those were key themes. Chapters 5 through 7, we saw Paul launching into, you know, morality, sexual immorality, the importance, the role of baptism in becoming a member of the body of Christ, becoming a temple of the Holy Spirit. You know, he challenged them to remove the uh, incestuous man from their midst. He said, you know, you've got, you have the role of judging those within your flock, those who are public, unrepentant sinners. You've got to remove them from your church. And he talked about marriage and celibacy. In chapters 8 through 10, remember he talked about food sacrifice to idols, right? Pagan idolatry, pagan, uh, pagan liturgy, all right? He talked about the Old Testament, gave Old Testament examples of the Israelites receiving gifts from God, the manna, the water, all these things, but they fell into sin. They fell into idolatry. Then he talked about, of course, the Eucharist, communion with God, the Eucharistic sacrifice, Last week we saw chapters 11 through 14, liturgical customs. We had a great discussion on chapel veils, right? That was lovely. And then Eucharistic abuses. We talked about that. The unity of the church, spiritual gifts, and of course, love is the the motive that should govern everything. And then today, chapter 15 and 16, the resurrection. So that's it, everybody. I really want to thank you for coming out so faithfully. I really hope you learned. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I thought it was awesome. I love 1 Corinthians. And every time you teach, you learn a lot. you got to commit yourself, right? So next time the Mormons come to your door or anybody, have a little Bible study with them. You'll learn a lot as well. So um, I don't know if you have any burning questions. we got to do this raffle. Got to give you a book. Yes, go ahead.